That's what they all say, sure. Hello and welcome. Uh, this is Art Jones, and um, welcome to Art Jones TV. Um, I have as our guest today James Christensen. Uh, we call him Tank. Be there to appreciate it. Um, go to his Twitter profile that we'll get to you uh, later, and you'll see. Is it A1 Abrams Tank on your profile? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, we can talk about a little bit about how I got my nickname here in a few minutes, if you'd like. But uh, it wasn't originally that tank. There's it wasn't a little originally story. that tank. No. Well, there's a reason for it. Because he's a massive man, <laughs> but he's also, and more importantly, for this discussion, he's co-founder of Click Magnet, uh, internet marketing, and he's a senior partner at House Edge Digital, which does marketing almost exclusively for casinos. And he's become a master at uh, harnessing big data. Um, SEO and and creating conversions for those casinos on their websites at a very high order. So we we have the pleasure of having the co-founder of Click Magnet Internet Marketing and senior partner with House Edge Digital, uh, a, a gentleman that knows an awful lot about what we want to hear about today: SEO and how web design and big data um, as uh, the big three. Can, can help each of us uh, convert more uh, visitors to our websites into uh, followers of our great content and hopefully uh, one day customers. Wow, so, no, no pressure there, Art. <laughs> no pressure. Well, with that, that introduction and, and now that I let the nickname leak out, you, you might want to um, help our audience understand better uh, about you, your businesses, and if you, you like, um, that that really cool nickname that you got. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll try to keep it fairly short so it's not too boring. Um, the nickname, my original marketing background was in radio. So I got started, gosh, 20 years ago at this point, being a part-time radio DJ in Las Vegas. And as part of the tradition of that particular station, you couldn't choose your own on-air name. Um, and it was about 20 minutes before I went on air, there was a Clint Eastwood movie, Every Which Way But Loose, and the bad guy was named Tank Murdoch. And so that was the last thing on TV before my first air shift ever. <laughs> the guy before me says, well, you, you drive a Buick, we can call you a Buick. And that wasn't so good. Or we can call you a Tank, and, and that's kind of it. And since I'm kind of a large guy, bald, um, it fit. Well, well, I have to say, you are much more, you're a kindler, gentler Tank than the guy in that Clint Eastwood movie. I know that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I wanted to be called Clint, but they wouldn't go for that. <laughs> um, well, well, neat. Well, listen, um, thanks for making time. I know it's a busy day. Um, uh, James is, is, is a anchor at a place called CoLab here in Tucson, where um, it's, it's part incubator, part think tank, part it's a very neat place to be. And as one of the anchors, um, everybody looks to Tank for knowing what they don't know about um, business, technology, and uh, who knows more, girlfriends. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think they need to all, find somebody else to advise there. All, all manner of, of uh, it, uh, an oracle of information. But I, I thought, well, I because you know, we're going to talk about SEO. Um, you know, Tank, do you, do you want to just give us the, maybe approach it in the sense that assuming people don't know what they don't know, and maybe let's climb up the ladder, if you will, and the first rung of the ladder is how search engines work. Can you give us, you know, 90 seconds on, on that? Sure. In, in a very simplified manner, um, every search engine, and we're talking about Google, Yahoo, Bing, um, there are some smaller ones out there now, um, some privacy-specific um, privacy search engines, but really the big guy in the world is Google. They put about 85% of all search results on the, uh, the web, uh, go through Google. So what these search engines do is they send out little pieces of script um, across the Internet. We call them spiders. We call them robots, um, just to kind of give them some sort of personality, if you will. And they go out and they test every single link on the Internet. And they go out and they see what each link has attached to it. Um, 
they look for relevancy, keywords, topics in all these links, and they come back and they add to their directory, and that's something that happens every day. Um, your usual website gets crawled maybe once a month, once every six weeks, depending on how often you update it. And it's just a, it's something that takes place every single day um, across the world, across the internet. Um, and that's why when you go into Google and you type a question, um, it goes back, looks at its logs, and says, okay, how much does the question, if it's how much does a kangaroo weigh, it goes back to its database, looks back to all the kangaroo related websites, anything that has those specific terms and hopefully it gives you a result that answers the question that you've typed in the little box. So it's something that happens every day um, and it's constantly getting refined um, but it's, it's the way people use the internet um, almost exclusively at this point is, is by typing a question into a search engine bar. You know, as opposed to what it originally was where you'd try to think of which website you want to go to and then you type in the address. Um, it, people don't operate that way anymore. So now we, we refer to that as semantic search yeah, to some degree, um, because you're basically asking it a question in semantic terms, um, and it's in a human like the answer to your question. It's it's interesting. Um, spiders. I I like to refer to them uh, as Pac-Man. From I'm from that era, and it kind of just goes across the internet and what it finds and interrogates and in interrogating those the information on those websites um, it's probably important for the audience to know when Google Bing and Yahoo and the other search engines are interrogating a website um, as the spiders are looking to see what they find is it important for us as we architect a website to have certain things and a certain kind of architecture or does it really matter? Uh, it's, it's a great question Art, thank you uh, it is important that you set up your site so it's very easy for the the Pac-Man, if you will, to go down the, to go down the different exactly go down the different links. Um, and the, the you know to step back just a, a few moments, this is such a new kind of technology that um, things that happened two or three years ago are different today. But really, we're looking to make the site architecture as easy as possible for Pac-Man to to find the links. Um, and I hesitate because I don't want to get too nerdy, but a few years ago you would have websites that when you clicked on a page, it automatically generated a new um, page title at the top. So you might see a, a string of numbers and question marks, and it was basically a random string of numbers. And now you don't see that because you want to you set up the site so that the pages have nice clear names that relate to the content of that page. Um, and again, it's all based on making it really easy for the search engines to find all the content on your website. You don't want to hide any of it, just make it easy for them to get to. So that's probably our first level of SEO is build the site so it's easily um, accessed by the search engines. Is, is, that, is that what you'd call on-page SEO kind of? That's more architecture, I would say, from okay. setting up the foundation of the site, um, making sure it has a great um, site map, making sure that the pages are built in sort of a logical progression. Um, so it's maybe if you have a page that is animals and then underneath that it's mammals and then underneath that it's I don't squirrels, you know, something that makes logical sense in your structure. Um, so it's, it, it sounds like very much like building a house, that if you have a strong foundation that when you erect the pillars and put the roof on and the walls in, that the foundation supports everything that you do later. So it's important foundationally, as you think about building a website or, or re-engineering a website, that you go back to the foundation and then build up from there, or at least go back to the foundation and assess the quality of what's already there to then build, build it up again or, or, or build from scratch. That's, that's an interesting concept because um, I know so many people go to um, GoDaddy and use the GoDaddy template to build the site versus going to WordPress, uh, which is similar, I guess, because it's a template that's already there. So you're not building it from scratch. Is there a difference then in going GoDaddy, WordPress, and building it on HTML? Or 
it, yes, there are differences in all those things. Um, and I think the biggest drawback to to going with a um, a ready-made platform like a GoDaddy plug and play or Squarespace is that these templates are set up for everybody to use. So what you get is you get kind of a least uh, least common denominator of sorts. You get a, a template that's designed for a thousand different types of websites. So you get a lot of extraneous extra code. You get things that aren't built that efficiently um, because they're trying to cover all these situations that could come up, all these possibilities. Um, and so that's different. When you look at a site that you're building from scratch, um, and scratch is kind of a relative term at this point because you've kind of got a foundation already, but um, so in the, one that's not just from a template, you're building it specifically for one application. So you're going to get rid of all the extra code that could confuse any of the, uh, the search engines. You're going to set it up so it's super transparent for them. Um, really, it's streamlining the efficiency of it. Um, whereas a template, again, it's meant for, it could be from my mom's cooking web page. It could be meant for a local small business. And they could be using basically the same template. Um, and so, yeah, it's free <laughs> in a lot of circumstances, but it's not built built ideally for the situation. Yeah. It's, it sounds like it's architected to serve the masses and enable them to build a website, not optimized for the search engines to... The search engines look at one of those platforms and say, hmm, a platform, I can't find the foundational things I'm looking for, it gets a certain ranking, whereas another site that has the integral pieces um, actually maybe gets a higher ranking. I know Tank and I were uh, having a conversation earlier and we were having some technical problems and I'm gonna just. Were you losing power in your battery? I was. We since we uh, we did so many test runs beforehand. It's funny how we can tell when it's a battery issue, or you know, because it's because uh, you're back so soon. Yeah, we're but, good now. Uh, I was saying that if you're using Wix or Weebly or all of those platforms that are ease of use in the UI with user interfaces is, is really what they're optimized for. Does a search engine like uh, Google? Because it can't find the foundational things it wants when it's ranking a site, does that uh, diminish the value of the site? It is certainly more of a challenge to get recognized by search engines than if you use something like that. Uh, I am not going to say it's impossible, but it when you're looking at all the ways to try to find the easiest way to rank, um, that can be a challenge because you're looking so you're going to look very similar to a hundred other Wix websites when it comes down to the code. Um, the only thing that's going to be different is you know a little bit of the content um, and it, again it depends on how you structure the hosting of it, how it's set up on the database, there's some back-end stuff that I'm not a hundred percent sure how Wix or Weebly will do it yeah. um, but they're trying to make it again as easy as possible um, and, and for some applications that's fine if you're not looking to create a business from your website it's probably not a big deal um, but, if, but if it's a business website, the, the counsel is to good counsel is to be more thoughtful about the tool you're going to use to build and and be committed to assuring that the foundational the foundation of the website is aligned with what is optimal for a search engine to find and read and interrogate, so it can find out the business that you're in, uh, the 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 value that you say you bring, so it can rank you among all the other people bringing the same value to market. Absolutely, and it's it's not particularly expensive to do it from the from the beginning correctly. Um, you know, you're, I get a lot of people that want to do the cost savings and go to the the free websites or free website builders, but when you're looking at it from a business standpoint, if you're you know, to invest a, a couple of thousand of dollars to do it correctly from the beginning, um, it really is, it's much more cost efficient to, to look at it that way. Um, we have some people here in town that, you know, they'll dedicate 2000 to $3,000 per billboard campaign 
and and not want to invest a couple thousand dollars in their website. And the website can be up for months and years, um, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, talking to your customers online. It really is the salesman that, that never sleeps. And what would you invest in that, you know, that particular portion of your business? Um, yeah, what would you pay for a salesperson that doesn't eat, doesn't sleep, and works 24 hours a day, every day? That's, that's a pretty good way of thinking about it. And you know, you mentioned billboards, and and I'm an inbound marketing kind of guy, so I I put billboards in the last century, and and everything else, this new media, and your website is in the new century, and should be thought of the same way because, as, as you said earlier, um, the search engines and the link. Um, websites and web pages and the algorithms they use to rank websites and web pages change on a constant basis. Um, so if you're not dynamic in the it's no longer can you build it and forget it. I remember guys building websites in the, the 90s, you know, they would build it and they'd never look at it again because that's what the search engines only cared about. You had some keywords in there, they found your site, you did some business. Today, um, with every algorithm uh, change, you can get knocked off the rankings. You might have been on the first page yesterday, but the algorithm changed, so you need to fix it to remain on that first page. So it takes a lot of work, and I think it's, if anything, if this uh, video does anything for, for our audience, it should be to help them appreciate the, uh, the importance of SEO. Um, and and importance of thinking it, of it like building a house because you pour the concrete but you make sure there's rebar in the concrete so it's strong so it can support all the other things you'll want to do as you build up. And with the last five years and the incredible surge of uh, social media, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. There's been, I think, a psychological shift in people are leading with, at least in the mind of the masses. They think they can lead with social media, and and they think, well, social media is outrun SEO. SEO is old. Social media is new. And I think, well, give us your perspective on that. <laughs> That's a great topic. It's um. It's fun because one of the the great things about being in this business is is things evolve so quickly, um, and I mention that because what my perspective three years ago, five years ago, is completely different than it is today. Um, mainly, the biggest change in my mind is that SEO is no longer a a separate discipline, if you will. Um, when we got into the business four or five years ago, we could offer here is an SEO program. We're going to tune up your website just by doing these things and like you said leave it alone you know insert your keywords get it ranking for a specific topic and then we could hand the keys off and the client could you know go about their way with with some increased rankings um, it's it's really not that anymore and that's really a good thing for I think everybody the industry um, the consumer um, that it's a it's an integrated aspect of your entire marketing plan so it sounds a little kind of hokey the way I positioned it right there but SEO is is less about this technical thing other than the foundation the architecture but it's really creating a website that's a good experience for your customer and your consumer and it's starting to really cross over into social media there's not a dividing line anymore about this is what's SEO and this is what's social media the same things that are good for search engines are the same thing that are good for social media which are the same things that are good for advertising um, so it's it's more of a, a blended, integrated approach to the whole problem at this point. Um, and it will go back to the social media being the only thing to do or to lead with social media. Um, anytime we talk to a client, we really want to talk about your overall strategies and your goals, and then social media might be an aspect of that, but I don't think it's it's the right way to look at the situation by saying you lead with this one, you lead with that one. Um, I think folks are, are oftentimes drawn to social media because it's less expensive, but it's not, you know, as you know, it's not advertising. 
it's a it's a whole different entity and it needs to be treated as such it's a it's an element into your entire marketing strategy but it's not going to take the place of your website it's not going to take the place of advertising um, it's just an adjunct to it or another aspect of uh, of communication with your customers and I know that was a whole long answer that probably didn't answer the question at all no, no I, th I think you did and I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to build on that because I think that was a good answer it's the I've been using this paradigm of the house and the foundation I'm going to shift and suggest that maybe think of it as a pyramid and, and you have to correct me if I'm, I'm wrong because I'm a marketer I'm not a an SEO expert and the notion that in the pyramid, at the base of the pyramid, the broadest part of the pyramid might be SEO. And, and foundationally, it supports everything that you do later. It supports the notion that you have you develop an SEO strategy only after you know who your ideal prospect is and you know who you're trying to attract. And, and that's, you're attracting that prospect to that landing page that I'm an Alfa Romeo fan, so when I type in Alfa Romeo, I'm taken to landing pages that don't talk about Italian cars, they talk about Alfa Romeo. Uh, they don't talk about fast cars or just exotic cars, Alfa Romeo. If they take me someplace else, I think I didn't ask for exotic cars, I asked for Alfa Romeo, and that's what I bounce and then I go back to my hit list and I find somebody that's going to take me where I want to go. But that sits on top of the foundation, the landing pages. Um, and I know I don't want to get too granular, but if I'm referring to SEO as foundational and the strategy, the strategy layer that lays on top of the SEO is to inform what do you want SEO to do for you? Who do you want to reach? And, and if I have two products in one service and they're all for different individuals, then I might have three landing pages and my SEO strategy has to serve those, those landing pages. And again, I might be oversimplifying, but uh, am I kind of on the right track? Absolutely. Um, I think a good example is we have a client um, in Phoenix that does commercial air conditioning. Well, they actually do. Let's step back. They actually do HVAC, so heating and air conditioning. Of course, in Phoenix, the demand for air conditioning is much bigger than it is for heating. Um, but a, a great example of what you just spoke about is that we have landing pages set up for their heating products, landing pages set up for their air conditioning products, um, a landing pages set up for their maintenance program, and that's all for a different kind of customer. If you're looking to uh, replace your air conditioning, you're probably going to type in something about air conditioning repair, replacement, but you're probably not going to mention heating. You're probably not going to mention filters. You're going to probably type in, I want to replace my air conditioning or air conditioning firms. And so we set up a landing page specifically for that customer because we want tailored for their problem and for our client to be seen as that solution to the problem. So yeah. even though the same company does heating, it's a different customer that's going to replace their heating unit. It's a different customer that's going to sign up for the maintenance program, but we want to treat them as though we only do whatever it is they're looking for. It's kind of the old analogy in the, in the traditional media of writing for the magazine or writing for the publication or you set up your copy and you set up your design specifically for the customer you're trying to reach at that moment. Yeah, um, as you were you were saying that, I was I was thinking about um, my moving from the house pyramid uh, paradigm to the pyramid paradigm, and I was making SEO the broadest part of the base. And actually, I'm going to recant that position. That's wrong <laughs> because I think strategy should be the base of the platform and that makes strategy sense. informs how you use the tools and the tactics that are your SEO, your landing pages, your social media, those things people think and often think that I'm going to use social media that's my strategy. Social media is a tool it is a tactic, it is not a strategy, just using it doesn't make you have a strategy. 
So the base of the pyramid should be strategy, and once you have that thoughtful strategy figured out, um, then you can start building up from that foundational position of a solid strategy. And, and your strategy, oh, by the way, should be informed by your business plan, and hopefully you have one of those as well. So your business plan informs your strategy, your strategy informs what you do in building your website and how you architect it um, to be the solution that will draw your ideal prospect to your pages that you're, you're building. And, uh, you know, if, if I had the luxury of everybody that I spoke to kind of understanding that strategic part um, and embracing it as, as important, because I think the human nature is, can't we just do it? Just do it. Make customers show up. I'm sorry, we, we really have to talk about your business plan and, and we have to integrate that with your the strategy we're going to use to get those customers to show up. And I think the unfortunate thing in my experience is that there are enough people, uh, solution providers, that will say, okay, I'll just do it. Accent strategy, I'll just do some SEO for you. You'll be fine. $3,000 a month. Thank you very much. And when you, when you agree to that, you really end up with no way of measuring that solution provider's performance because you have no way of measuring what they just did, which is, is uh, unfortunate. I mean, it's, uh, so it's, it's good to, it's important. Well, let me, I'll ask the question. What are the top two or three things that a, a business owner should consider before they go and hire someone to build a site, implement their SEO, and campaign on landing pages? What, is there three things or ten things or? Let me get my list. Um, <laughs> No, I, I just want to say I'm really excited that you mentioned all of those things previously because it is it is such an, an issue for us as a as a company because we see other people um, wanting to provide that solution without measurability, and we know that that's a it's a short term viewpoint and it's not really set up for the long term success of the client, which is what we're looking to do. Right. Um, Without trying to stroke our own ego, one of the, the things that we like to say separates us from other agencies is that we go into a relationship talking about the business goals and strategies of that business rather than the solution. You need a website, you need an email campaign, you need social media. Because like you said, all those things are just tactics to help you achieve the goals of the business or whatever strategy you're trying to, uh, to outline for your company. Yeah. Um, so it went off the path a little bit, but I just wanted to say I appreciate well, that. Well, no, and, and I'll, I'll build on what you just said about, you know, um, solution providers. I, I, I like to, there's a guy that I, I quote often, Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow was a thinker early, mid uh, 20th century, and he developed an idea called the hierarchy of needs. And it was all about, you know, we need food, shelter, so forth and so on. And it's widely used in social psychology, uh, anthropology. He also had a, an idea that he called the law of the instrument. And the law of the instrument is one I love because I think it applies to the business that we're in. And the law of the instrument says that if all, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I have to say, you know, I spent most of my career on the sales side of conversation selling technology. Um, I became a solution architect, business analyst, project manager, but most of all I became a problem solver because I, I knew how to listen for an explicit need that the customer sometimes didn't even know they had. And, and that was a very rewarding part of that, that job. But the, the, the other thing that really became, uh, that came out of that is that when I crossed over to, from sales to marketing uh, about six years ago now, social media was all the rage. And people wanted to label me a social media expert. So when somebody came to me 
with a business problem, I got my social media hammer out and I said, oh, so you've got a business problem. Well, I've got social media. Let's fix that. Every problem early in my marketing career looked like social media. And that's when I, I went from social media to, it's not social media, it's about creating great content. And then I evolved from creating great content to making sure that I was creating great content with the proper context for my ideal prospect. And then I went from there, content in the proper context, absent a great story, didn't resonate with an audience. And that great story is even more embraceable when it's visual. So, so it, those tools, all of those, Pinterest, uh, Twitter, Facebook, WordPress blog, all those things are tools and tactics that help you assess a potential customer's explicit need so then you can put the pieces together and you it's kind of like 3D printing. <laughs> it's I 3D print solutions for each customer as an individual because each customer, each client's business problems are going to be different. So I can't say I'm a Pinterest expert and I can fix your problem. Everybody that comes to me gets Pinterest. I think that, and surely I don't want to besmirch the brands of people that do Pinterest because I know that people, there are people that say, no, I can't help you with Pinterest. You need more. You need SEO. But for the marketplace and for the, 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 the audience that's listening, it's important to, to, to be thoughtful uh, about when you hire consultants, you can think of Maslow's law and the law of the instrument. If all they have is a hammer, your problem is very likely going to look like a nail and you need to ask second and third level questions about should I be considering any of the other 1,500 things that are available out there to help me grow my business and um, see what the response to that is. I think there are a lot of great analogies you could you could use to that. You know, I, if, I'm not a sports guy, but I keep going back to my high school coaches telling me about fundamentals, fundamentals. Um, so you wouldn't go out and try to learn how to play basketball by just doing a slam dunk. You'd spend hours and hours doing you know dribble exercises and sprints and all these good fundamental kinds of things. Um, and you're absolutely right. It you know I know in the financial industry market, if you go to a financial advisor very likely the suggestions he's going to suggest are going to be products that he can sell. He's probably not going to tell you he, your uh, ideal solution is something he can't offer. Um, we're kind of lucky in the technology world that we can offer a lot of different products and I don't I don't have a, a hang up about selling one tactic or deliverable versus another. My entire goal is to help you with your, your business goals, your business um, metrics. Um, to kind of go back to the question about what should people ask their agency, I think they should definitely see what questions the agency asks. The agency should be asking what the goals of the business are. You know, how do you define your success? Is it, um, you know, higher sales per person, per customer? Is it repeat business from the same customer? Is it new customers? Um, so it's, you know, larger purchase size, that kind of thing. If they're not asking you these questions, they're more concerned about, what they have to sell to you. Um, so, you know, there are basic metrics you look at for every type of business. If you're just looking for increased um, visitorship to your website, that's great. But I'm always going to ask, how does that boil down to another conversion? How do you have you collected information from that prospect? Are you able to reach them? You know, in another way next week. There are just all these different levels of of, of metrics. But I think it's important. Just like you like Maslow, I love. Uh, I like to tri attribute it to Franklin Covey, but I don't think he's the guy that said it. But if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and so we're so big on measurement. Um, yeah. But it's it's different metrics for different businesses. When we work with a nonprofit, um, their goal is not to make profit. Curiously enough, even though some of them are quite profitable, yeah. they might have a metric of uh, donations or outreach 
people touched in the community, that kind of thing, versus somebody where I'm just doing a straight e-commerce site, and it's a, a conversion metric between how many people visit the site to how many people put something in the shopping cart, how many people check out, and then final, you know, shipping, that kind of stuff. So it really depends on what kind of business you have and, and the goals for that business. Um, I think you 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 made the, the the perfect point, and if I think I I would certainly encourage everyone in the marketplace to effective listening is important. It's a two way street. You know, I use effective listening to help identify the explicit need, so I can know what and problem I need to solve. I think the 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 potential customer or the client needs to use effective listening, as you said. To find out, am I just pushing a, a, a product or am I seeking to understand where your pain points are so I can apply the, the ideal solutions to, to help you advance and, and, and improve your position? The, uh, the notion that I can ask the insightful and thoughtful questions to, to understand what the explicit need is. The explicit need will tell me what the business is really, what the problem is, and around that is their mission, what they want to accomplish. And if I say, if I, if I can do these two things, um, how would that help your business? I mean, if I can improve day sales outstanding and I can do something else, how does that help your business? I say, well, if you can do that, um, then you know, I get a promotion and everybody on my team goes to the steakhouse, you know, on Saturday night. Because that's part of the, the, the business goal. And when I do those things and I implement them, then that business owner or that company has a way of measuring, because I commit it to move the needle. And, and when I don't do that, they should hold my feet to the fire and say what happened. But when I do do that, they should say, oh my gosh, you delivered on time and at budget, and you moved the needle. We are so happy. And at the end of the day, being, a lot of guys don't want to be measured. Because measuring me, you put me at risk, because I might fail. <laughs> but I like being measured and, and my feet being held to the fire, because it holds me to a standard that I think all consultants should be held to, held to, which is you hire me and pay me X number of dollars to help you improve your position in the business. And if I do that, um, I ex expect some love in return. And, and the love is that generally that customer gives you a glowing referral and say he did what he said he was going to do on time and at budget. And that referral is the kind of reference that helps you get additional business. Um, and it establishes that the basis for doing business with other people. So, you know, you, you've said several times as you've been outlining uh, what's important, the importance of metrics. If it can't be, how do you say it? If it can't be measured, it can't be... Managed. Managed. And that really is, it's, it's just that thin layer above strategy. Once you come up with that strategy, you put a veneer of, if it can't be measured, it can't be managed. Because it always keeps you mindful of everything that you do should have on that timeline some metric that you're shooting for. And in that weekly or monthly report you show to Mr. Customer, it's there because this is what they signed off on. And here's how we're doing against that mission. Um, you know, it's, it's great when great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I have... Uh my background in casino marketing to thank for that. Casinos are so analytically driven that um, I just gravitated towards the concrete nature of those things. In marketing, I don't know about you, but I often get uh, get told, well, marketing is kind of this fun art blend, not Art Jones, but the fun blend of, of art. It's not really a science. It's and fuzzy. It's, it's, it's fuzzy. fuzzy. Right, but one of the nice things about the technology sector is that we are able to measure absolutely every single thing that we do. Um, you mentioned about traditional or traditional marketing with print and media and, and billboards and TV. Very, very challenging to measure. 
Um, and I came from that. I'm old enough that I started in traditional marketing. But there's the old adage of, what, 80% of your marketing fails, but I don't know which 20% does or something like that. <laughs> right. How do you know that your, your magazine print ad made an impact? Um, it's very difficult. You can measure how many eyes saw it, but it's tough to attribute it to a single sale. Um, and that's one of the, the beautiful things about the technology world is that we're able to attribute every single thing to our efforts and, and measure it. Um, dashboards are amazing. It just just how personnel react to seeing things in a visual manner gives them sort of this buy-in that you can't get necessarily from a print ad. Um, something they can look at that's tangible, or not really tangible, but visual, so that they can see that they are moving or having an effect on the business. Um, I think it's great. I'd like to go back to something we talked about probably 15 minutes ago, and it's the, the, the notion that um, SEO and, and SMM, social media marketing, are, are kind of a blend now. It's, it's no longer SEO against social media, where there were two camps at one point. It's now those camps have come together and, and join forces, if you will, to help move the needle. And what's really uh, neat about that is that, you know, in the in the the marketplace, my phone is on my little tripod right now, but <laughs> my big old Android Galaxy Note 3 is part phone, part tablet, and it enables me to be an empowered consumer. At any point in the day, if somebody's going to buy something that's with me and they say, well, you know, I'm going to buy this stove or that stove or this car or that car, I say, okay, Google, and I get a response right away. If there's 7 billion people on the planet, there's 5 billion mobile devices. That means the marketplace is empowered because of this. And when you are doing business 20 years ago in traditional meat marketing, you controlled the narrative and you could almost make us buy what you wanted us to buy. But you had enough money and enough billboard space, you could make me buy Frosted Flakes or whatever you wanted me to buy. Because Tony Tiger said it was so. <laughs> but now this thing empowers me that I'll listen to you before I'll listen to Mercedes or Audi or BMW. I, I, want to, I want to ask my friends on Facebook, online, my friends at the, uh, the picnic, offline, and, and I'm saying all that to say that all of these strategies and tactics that we're talking about, we need to spend much more time thinking about how to use those strategies and tactics, the combination of SEO and social media. Because when I say, OK, Google, I'm sophisticated enough to know how to separate the signal, which is what I want, from all the noise that's out there. And, and we can create a lot of noise just by doing SEO. We can create a lot of noise just by posting 60 times a day on Twitter. But the, the marketplace that we've become, smarter than any of our forebears because of these mobile devices, are harder to reach. And um, I think that that's probably a conversation for another session because it's a big idea. And it, it really, I mean, because we started talking about landing pages, and that's a subject in and of itself. Um, we, we haven't talked about keywords that drive activity. Um, we haven't talked about link building. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about the, the, the navigation ease that I navigate a site. I mean, all of those things, we haven't talked about, you know, the, uh, I forget what I'm, I'm thinking. I want to call it a marketing funnel. But yeah, the there's marketing. so many things that we haven't talked about, I guess, that, um, and, and I know we've probably spent 40 minutes at this point chatting about SEO, and, and I've enjoyed it. I have to tell you that it's, uh, it's thoughtful and a lot of insightful commentary, and I'll remember 
I think I've heard that term before, but I'll use it again. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I think for the audience listening, if there's one takeaway, um, and you're thinking of getting engaged in web design or SEO or social media, um, that's probably the one thing that you want to listen for. Is the solution provider that you're having the conversation with, are they committed to measuring their performance of the work that you're paying them for? And, and if they are, maybe they're the provider that, that you should select. If they're not, be beware, because <laughs> you're, you're just going to throw money down a, a rabbit hole. But um, I'd love to continue the conversation next month, next sometime downstream, because uh, you're such a wealth of information and, and, and practical experience, because you're in the business. Um, so I'll, I'll come calling and say, hey, give us another half hour that will turn into 45 minutes. <laughs> And, and, and do it because, you know, hopefully the audience that's listening uh, benefits from the knowledge that you've gained over your long career in, in marketing and, and SEO um, and helping businesses grow. I love it. I, I'd love to, you know, I talk as long as you'd have me um, because it helps everybody. I think as, as the consumer or the client or the business owner gets more and more educated, um, it only helps our business as well. It weeds out the, the people that aren't there for the right reasons and uh, it kind of raises the standard that everybody follows so I would be glad to talk as, as on many subjects as you'd like um, as long as you'll have me I appreciate it. Fantastic that. well thanks for joining us today um, in light of the fact that it's Friday and it's getting later in the day I think we should we should sign off and uh, have a wonderful weekend and, and you know one of the other subjects before I forget that I'd really like to, to get to, to chat with you about. Now, you've only mentioned it once, but I remember the fact that you and your family travel to Mexico and you do the good work of. It, is your mom's a veterinarian? She is. She is. Thanks for bringing that up. We do a, a spay and neuter clinic uh, in Mexico once a year for a, a three day span. Um, just one of those random things that we do. We don't get to measure much. How many, how many neuters we do? <laughs> but that's good work. Um, you know, if it wasn't done, you know, there, there'd be more uh, chihuahuas running around <laughs> that, than there need to be. And, and uh, you know, for the dogs to have a good life, to keep the population in, in order, um, it's good work. And um, I'm sure the experiences um, are good and gratifying, and that the uh, the cerveza and the uh, the tacos are equally enjoyable. We make those trips, but I'd like to, to revisit that conversation and learn more about that work that you you and your family do um, uh, as well. So thanks, thank you, sir, for making time, and thank you, audience, for tuning in. Um, we'll we'll be here often. Um, Art Jones TV talking to thought leaders and key opinion leaders on many subjects um, that help you and your business grow. So so thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thanks, Tank. Thanks, Art. <laughs>